The ablest accomplice of crime is deception, and the most damning accomplice of civilization is hubris. The historical human march to the best in us has always been halted and beaten back by the demonic criminals who have no depths worse enough to dive to. If human aspiration, peace, love, liberation and greatness is your civilizational objective, then ignorance of facts, acquiescence to crime and silence in the face of existential assault are your most damning death wishes. Darkness and negativity have to be and should be countered with all our might and abilities. Doubts in that path are as criminal as the stratagems of the criminals perpetrating the destruction. Deepthi Marla belonged to the Kodagu district of Karnataka. She was studying bachelor's in dental at a college in Deralakate when she met Anas and fell in love. She converted and became Mariam. She married Anas Abdul Rahman, son of B.M. Basha, son of Ulal MLA, B.M. Idin Abba. In January of 2022, National Investigation Agency, the NIA, raided B.M. Basha's house and arrested Deepthi Marla, Ayas Mariam, for suspected ISIS links. They had earlier raided Basha's house in August of 2021 and arrested his other son, Amar Abdul Rahman. Though they suspected Mariam's involvement with ISIS, they had not really arrested her, but were monitoring her nevertheless. NIA wanted her for her involvement in a racket where youth were recruited for ISIS network. Isn't it incredible that a Hindu girl was groomed while in college and had become the most important recruiter and kingpin for the global terrorist organization, ISIS, with the overwhelming aim of establishing an Islamic state. An outrageous criminal industry has been created and is being run to uproot the very basis of civilization as we know it. And the responses range from silence to acquiescence to political correctness outright denial. Women are victims, but no feminist dares talk about it. Patriarchal structures are being unleashed for such crimes, but no work ever squeaks. It is in this situation that we get an eye-opener of a movie called The Kerala Story, a story about how three girls are converted and then trafficked for terrorism. Let us look into the entire phenomenon, unfortunately global in its expanse and vision, that is tearing down the very foundations of civilization as we know it. In England, thousands of girls have been targeted by predominantly Pakistani Muslim gangs for sexual interactions. Here is a very heartbreaking interview with Dr. Ella Hills, who is a Rotterdam grooming gang survivor where she reveals that there have been half a million victims over the last 40 years of grooming gangs' sexual exploitation and rape industry. Here's the kicker. Despite all the evidence, her pleas and the ongoing crimes, the law enforcement agencies were helpless and quiet. The existing laws were flouted and not applied in the favor of girl victims for the fear of offending the criminals. It is only now in 2023 that the government has put the focus on battling the menace of grooming gangs in the UK. That these rape crimes are committed by Pakistani Muslims has been known to all. It is such an overwhelming failure of the entire British law enforcement system in the name of political correctness. The predominance of Pakistani men is a very interesting factoid because a 2009 investigation by the Kerala police showed that Pakistani terrorist organizations were planning, abetting, and financing the project of enticing college girls of different communities to become cannon fodder for its program. In a report in 2021, a legal action 
non-profit organization called Reprieve shared the situation with the numerous British girls and women who were trafficked to Syria by Muslim male partners and their cohorts after deceptively trapping them in relationships. As for the report, any apparent consent of the victims to be controlled and exploited in these cases is irrelevant. When any of the means, including fraud, deception, or coercion, has been used to get that consent, or there has been an abuse of a position of vulnerability, meaning that the person had no choice. We are looking at a complex web of coercion, human trafficking, sexual abuse, and terrorism intertwined via a religious stratagem to orchestrate change in the demography of a country or a region. The phenomenon of Stockholm Syndrome, where the victims fall prey to the false emotional or psychological attachment to their controller, is also a manifestation of the psychological coercion. And that needs to be understood very clearly. Grooming and Stockholm Syndrome are tools of psychological coercion. If these two elements are part of the conversion process, then it is a criminal enterprise that needs a larger investigation. We need to approach the criminal enterprise of religious conversions with such a specific scientific basis. Dr. Shirley Julich and Dr. Eileen Oak wrote a research paper published in a New Zealand social work journal where they investigated the link between grooming and Stockholm Syndrome. The paper was titled, Does Grooming Facilitate the Development of Stockholm Syndrome? And the Social Work Practice Implications. Dr. Shirley Julich identified conditions that exist in offender-victim relationships that are characterized by Stockholm Syndrome. They are very instructive. Dr. Julich says Stockholm Syndrome is a useful concept as it can provide an overarching understanding of why victim survivors of child sexual abuse and respond as they do. Much research has been done on victimized groups such as the concentration camp prisoners, cult members, incest victims, prisoners of war, and in all group, bonding between the offender and the victim occurred when four conditions coexisted. Which are these four conditions? Perceived threat to survival and belief that one's captor is willing to execute that threat. The captive's perception of some small kindness from the captor within the context of terror, isolation from perspectives other than those of the captor, perceived inability to escape, the centrality of the destruction of old relationships and practices, rituals, festivals, when converted, is a given. Read this article on how a girl from Bradford, UK was converted to a she met a Yemeni man online. Alia's pregnancy didn't help her relationship with her own family. I was desperately unhappy being away from my family. My mother was finding it hard to and would beg me to come home, but we were at loggerheads about my decision. She she thought I was being reckless while I thought she was being unsupportive. As Christmas approached, Alia began to struggle with the cultural differences. Anadi's family, who was her husband, weren't celebrating. I felt so internally conflicted. I was prepared to commit to Islam, but seriously struggled giving up all of the things that I loved so much about my old life, but that were no longer applicable. It is easy to see how grooming happened. It needs specific understanding when it comes to Stockholm Syndrome, and that is a concept of kindness. The most damning element of Stockholm Syndrome is a perception of kindness by the victims. This acts as the building block and the glue to create and reinforce the abuse within the context of this syndrome. Acts like even cessation of abuse are seen as kindness. The normalizing of Stockholm Syndrome is striking and its understanding spectacularly missing even in the popular culture. If you have watched the advertisement of uh, Tanishk, you'll see that while a woman is converted and her old religion was put aside, this is a small gesture that does not violate the religion of the new family is perceived as an act of immense kindness that her entire life's belief, faith and personality were undermined is not seen as an abuse. Psychopaths objectify others and have no real empathy. The other person is not understood as a person but as a mere object of desire or use. When the foundation of your relationship, 
that you choose to call love is based on negation and putting aside your lover's hitherto identity, then isn't your approach during courtship a mere deception? Rituals like eating beef to complete the conversion process underline this very urge of negating the previous identity because nowhere in the Arab lands were there any cows to begin with. So this relationship between beef and Islam is all made up. The experts have identified specific common traits and patterns in workings of psychopaths, specifically with respect to the so-called romantic relationships. It is very important to look at the patterns and the way they go about it. For one, we'll see very clear similarities between the patterns that are signatures of a psychopathic relationship with the patterns of grooming. The manipulator saturates the target person in multiple ways with feigned love and adoration, with a declaration of appreciation and praise without giving the person a moment to think. This is also called love bombing, a strategy very common in grooming techniques. Modus operandi is to spend as much time as possible meeting and keeping in frequent touch. Common patterns include intense mirroring or copying the body language, traits, speech patterns, personality. A sense that a person is walking and talking in rhythm with you. And this goes on. You know, the sense is that the psychopaths employ lying, secrets, grooming, manipulation and exploitation to achieve what they set out to do. This is a stage one, which is called idealize. Stage two is devaluation. Once the target is hooked, manipulative ways start to gain control over the other. The use, they use an abusive strategy called intermittent reinforcement, where a pattern of cruel, callous treatment is mixed in with random bursts of affection. During this stage, the following patterns can be seen. Withdrawing all the warmth and charm and attention that have reeled you in. Sometimes becoming openly abusive with insults, blatant lies, belittling, mocking, criticizing, undermining, embarrassing you in group scenarios, or open threats and silent treatment. Becoming cold, icy, distant and aloof. Drastically reducing their availability and contact. Covert abuse, you know, mind games are played, double meanings, dismissive and insulting metacommunications. Gaslighting is done, inverting reality and denying wrongdoing, despite clear evidence to the contrary. During this stage, self-doubt, self-questioning and low self-esteem are instilled in the victim. The mind games are structured to keep the victim on the defensive, even when the victim has done no wrong. And the third stage is called the discard. In this stage, the psychopath has moved the abuse to a, such a level that there is no sense of adventure left in that person. They will discard you and move on to the next target. The victims are left devastated with no recourse. And in such a stage, the patterns of the toxic person may simply break off all contact with the victim with no explanation or excuse, may break off openly with a cruel, dismissive, cold message or conversation, may cheat openly without even trying to hide it. In the grooming love jihad stories, victims are manipulated into terrorism between stage two and three. That is the case with one individual who manipulates people for creating psychopathic relationships. Now imagine, imagine if there was an assembly line producing such psychopathic relationships. In November of 2017, India Today did an expose on Zaneva, the head of Kerala's PFI, and her husband. In one of the videos, PFI's woman wing leader discusses the modus operandi on how conversions are orchestrated. And there she explains, We don't have to officially declare it to be a conversion center. It's an educational institute, Zaneva says. A lot of preparation goes into it. We need resources. We have to create a trust first. She disclosed such secret centers have to have at least 15 members for registration as a trust. The surreptitiously run conversion factories, which are run under the garb of educational institutes, have been converting Hindus and Christians to Islam. Was it for bettering their life or to help them? No. 
It was all done to further one aim of the Islamists, an Islamic state. In fact, Emma Sharif, PFI's founder member and managing editor of its mouthpiece, the Gulf Tejas, also confessed to illegal funding. And when he was asked, all over the world, that is the motive, acknowledged Sharif when asked whether the PFI and Satya Sarani, which is the PFI's women wing, worked on the hidden motive to establish Islamic State in India, as has been suspected. And he says, all over the world, that is the motive. Islamic State is the final goal, the reporter asked. Final goal, Sharif replied. All over the world, why only India? After making India an Islamic State, and then they will go to the other states. That is the goal of these conversion factories. And one needs to understand that this does not happen in a vacuum. The funding is going on from different sources. The majority of the funding comes from illegal hawala process to PFI for its conversion factories. But the media went to town announcing that per SIT, no funding comes from abroad for love jihad when a specific probe by SIT was about only 14 cases lodged in Kanpur's police stations. That is a tactic that they use to whitewash all the crimes by specifically underlining just one evidence in a bunch of the entire range of evidence and going to town with only that one thing and talking about it. Why is there a dichotomy between what the founder of an Islamist organization reveals and what the mainstream media says in the investigation and what it revealed? Because the SIT was for the cases in Silic police stations in one city, as I said, versus what, what has been practiced across the country as a matter of strategy. It is almost as if there is a sense of urgency to wash away the very existence of factory-like process that has been followed across the region for establishment of an Islamic state by the Islamist organization. Kerala is actually divided into two regions, the North Kerala and South Kerala. North is called Malabar and South is basically the Travancore and Cochin area. The religious distributions are very, very distinct. There's a predominantly Muslim population in the North side and predominantly Christian uh, population on the South. Change has, the attack on Kerala's demography was brought out in 2010 by the then Kerala Chief Minister V.S. Achutanathan at a press meet in Delhi. There he said the f Muslim fundamentalists in the state were trying to increase their clout by encouraging conversions. For achieving that goal, he alleged that the outfits were, were pumping money to attract youth and giving them weapons. The, they also persuade them to marry Hindu girls. This was in line with the investigation by India Today that we have already discussed earlier, you know, with Zanibar. It is not as if the evidence is not there or the people have not talked about this extensively. They have. In the court case, Shahan Shah versus State of Kerala on 9th of December 2009, Kerala High Court Justice Katie Sankaran discussed the phenomenon of love jihad and discussed about it as a project. That is what he discussed. A lot of money is available for executing the project. Apart from that, the several people who have discussed the same points over and over again, whether it is the Kerala Bishop Joseph Kalarangat, who says their aim is to promote their religion and end non-Muslims, they use love jihad and narcotic jihad, a girl who was trapped through love jihad, converted to Islam, tortured and was being prepared to be transported to Syria to deliver her to the Islamic State, the ISIS recruiters in Kerala, Fayas and Siad were arrested by Arnakulam Rural SP, and the case was handed over to NIA. All these cases have been met with same silence, criminal acquiescence, denial, and even pushback, just as the grooming gang cases in the UK were met with. Whatever way you look at it, we have a civilizational war at our hands. Because ultimately, we are dealing with women trafficking at a very large assembly line scale. We have established a few things by now through various sources and evidence, right? A crime is being committed against women who are being trafficked. Not a few isolated crimes, but in several thousands. 
across geographies in different ways with only one aim establishment of islamic state legal loopholes political correctness political expediency vote bank politics silence terror funding and global infrastructure are all used to perpetrate this bottom line women are cannon fodder in a religious criminal enterprise that is where our societies are under the onslaught of islamic state's ambition whether it is uk india in general kerala specifically european countries in general nordic countries in specific we have an islamist grooming epidemic the sooner we realize the better it is for our civilization at least with respect to uk and india there is enough evidence to see involvement of pakistanis in orchestrating planning executing and funding this entire criminal enterprise make no mistake it is a form of terrorism love bombing replaces suicide bombing the aims the means the players and the psychopathic mindset behind this form of terrorism is the same as any it is time that it is recognized as a global crime and countries impacted by this terror epidemic collaborate to openly chuck out detailed and executable plans to counter this large menace women trafficking is the tool terrorism is its way and religious imperialism is its agenda so above all it is a crime against women if nothing else but no action will be possible unless we acknowledge that a crime is being committed and that is where we need to start use surveillance forensics data analytics and technological evidence to establish the crime the handlers the process and the impact without clear evidence it becomes a he said she said match of words and in that gray area that criminal enterprise thrives for manipulating words opinions and political discourse is a skill that has been mastered by these groups it is a civilization crying now to be a bystander